Oral questions by members? Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, despite us asking the Premier repeatedly last week, we've, had, we've heard absolutely nothing about a guarantee that the circuit breaker grant that was announced would be extended if current health restrictions are. After more than 60 years, the owner of the famous Roundup Cafe in Surrey is calling it quits. The owner, Dennis, says, and I quote, it wasn't on our terms to go out. Current restrictions made it tough to even break even and try to get ahead, end quote. There are hundreds of restaurants, just like the Roundup Cafe, that may also close because this Premier refuses to take additional action. So let's try it again today. Will the Premier commit to extending the Circuit Breaker grant program if health restrictions continue for weeks ahead? Minister of Jobs, Economic Recovery and Innovation. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. And uh, I don't think there's a person in this House that doesn't know that it's a challenging time for businesses throughout BC, uh, in particular our restaurant industry, which is at half capacity. And if they don't have uh, outdoor dining, uh, it's even more challenging, uh, just relying on takeout and, and then sometimes uh, delivery. Um, uh, I don't, uh, I'm not quite sure the member's question about extending the program. The program is available till June for businesses to apply. Uh, money is available right now for them to apply if they, if they need so. Uh, and we've been encouraging businesses to apply even today when we had a meeting with um, folks uh, that represent restaurants and breweries and pubs across the province. Uh, we made the case for them to continue to push and remind their members that the dollars are available. But that being said, we're going to continue to engage with them just like we have from the beginning, Honourable Speaker, and we're proud of the supports we've put in place. We've listened, we've been nimble from the beginning, and we're going to continue to be so until we're out of this pandemic. Leader of the Official Opposition, Supplemental. Well, thank you very much. Uh, listening is one thing. Taking action that actually meets the needs of restaurants across British Columbia is apparently completely foreign to this minister. Every single day in British Columbia, more and more and more businesses are at risk of permanently closing their doors. And that's the best answer that the minister can come up with. Left out of this equation, completely left out, are the young frontline workers who were given no hope and no funding by this Premier. The more the delays, the more and more bills become due at the end of the month. Take the words of longtime server Tasha Hodel, who says, and I quote, it really shows you that there isn't much support, end quote. So, yet again to this Premier, Yet another program botched, bungled, and out of touch with the needs of young frontline workers in British Columbia. So will the minister get up today, fix the gaps in this program, and provide desperately needed money for restaurant workers in tomorrow's budget? Minister of Jobs and Economic Recovery. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And, uh uh, you know, the circuit breaker program has been uh, very positively received. Uh, I've mentioned many quotes to the leader of the opposition last week. Um, the chamber uh, president told us, uh, said to the media, we applaud the BC government for their quick action to provide the uh, financial supports businesses need. Uh, Able BC said this uh, announcement is a lifeline. Uh, I've got pages uh, uh, for the member for Kamloops who uh, jumped in uh, of quotes from business stakeholders who think this program is actually uh, hitting the mark. And you know why they think that, Honourable Speaker, is because they worked with us on it. We listened to them. We engaged with them. We worked on the details of the program with them. So they know it hits the mark. We know it hits the mark. And we encourage businesses to apply for that program. It's available. A uh, member talked about extending it. There's no need to extend it. The program is available for businesses. We strongly encourage them to, to do so. And as far as the budget goes, Honourable Speaker, uh, you know, the budget uh, will be tabled together. I know that uh, the opposition is excited to see it. Certainly us in government are excited to see it. We think that uh, it's going to continue to meet the needs of British Columbians, just like the last budget did and just like the budget before that as well. Member for Peace River South. Well, thank you. Look, workers in my riding and around the province are actually just getting sick and tired of the arrogance and disdain being shown by this minister and this government. Imagine this. After 90 years of operation, most of us in this house will remember going out 
as a kid or taking your kids out for a pirate pack. There's not too many things in this province that symbolize BC more than white spots. But thanks to this Premier, this government, and their decisions, my local white spot is being shut down permanently in Dawson Creek, which means people are out of work permanently from this place. Thanks to the health orders, too many taxes, and too much uncertainty by this government. I know Jason. Jason works there. He's worked there since high school. He's worked there for 30 years. And he contacted me to say, what do I do now? What is the government going to be doing for me? After 30 years working there, I'm now out of a job, as well as 40 other people that work in this establishment. So to the Premier, will workers like Jason be seeing any new, any new financial relief or support at all to help them now losing their jobs to help them pay their bills? Minister of Jobs and Economic Recovery. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. And uh, again, uh, I think everyone understands that you know, we're in the middle of a global pandemic. It's going to be a challenging time until we can start seeing these businesses that have been uh, relying on operating at full capacity uh, until they're able to do so. It's going to be a challenging time. Again, uh, I know the members don't like hearing this, because it's, but it's a fact. We have the highest per capita support for people and businesses in this country. We're proud of that. It's reflected in, uh, in the job numbers that have been coming through, even in a pandemic. We're still, as a province, doing well compared to other jurisdictions. And I, and I feel for the young person who has lost that job. And that's why, just even a couple of weeks ago, the Minister of Advanced Education announced millions in new uh, scaling and reskilling uh, re programs at our various university, partnering with BC Tech Association, partnering with a whole host of different organizations. We announced a youth uh, employment program, $42 million, Honorable Speaker, that helps put people to work in parks, helps clean our oceans, get some of their first tech jobs. So, Honorable Speaker, we're putting the supports in for people just like that who've been displaced from work, and we want to create more opportunities for them so they can get good paying jobs and be able to stay here in British Columbia. Member for Peace River South on Supplemental. Well, thank you. That answer just highlights the disconnect from this minister and this government of what's happening on the ground. People are losing their jobs now. They have bills to pay now. They're looking for help and support from this government now. Not later, now. In a small community like Dawson Creek, losing an employer like White Spot is huge, not only for the jobs lost, but for the community itself. And Jason and so many like him are just feeling left behind by this Premier and this government. Jason says, and I quote, thanks to these lockdowns, I'm now out of a job. If this was indeed a state of emergency, this Premier would be helping out businesses and employers and workers now, end quote. So, again, will the Premier help Jason and many other workers like him with financial relief now, not later, now? Minister of Jobs and Economic Recovery. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I do think um, from the question, I'm, I'm sure, I hope that the member does support needs for restrictions uh, to keep COVID, uh, COVID numbers down. Uh, I didn't, it wasn't entirely clear from the question, the way you phrased it, whether he supports measures uh, that have been uh, advanced by a provincial health officer. It's critically important, Honourable Speaker. I, I saw the presentation from the uh, provincial health officer, and, uh, and I appreciate the businesses struggling in Dawson Creek. We saw the numbers. We know they're considerably high in Dawson Creek. So the measures we're putting in place are to ensure that we can keep communities and people safe, Honourable Speaker. Again, historic uh, investments to support businesses and people in this province. We're proud of the supports we put in place. Of course, there's more to do. And we're going to continue to do that. And I'm looking forward to seeing the budget tomorrow so we can show the public there's going to be more investments in people and businesses across this uh, province. Leader of the Third Party. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. Given what's unfolding in other parts of Canada right now, British Columbians are looking to their government for how we are going to avoid the same outcomes in BC. Last week, the Premier said, vis-a-vis -vis COVID, we will use the tools that are available to us if we believe they are effective. The Minister of Health said he's open to our suggestions, so let's give some. Experts are calling to significantly ramp up testing, including rapid testing in workplaces and regions where cases are high. Non-invasive tests like the gargle test could be done twice a week with government acting on the positives and confirming those with PCR tests as is happening in the UK right now where every single citizen has access to free rapid testing in that country. 
This could be a significant element of a plan going forward. We can restrict interprovincial travel, as has, is seen in other provinces, to limit the spread of variants and focus our attention on British Columbians. And we could be pressuring the federal government to get serious about restricting international travel. My questions for you, Honourable Speaker, is to the Premier. Cases have risen dramatically. Hospitalizations are breaking records. What is the line at which government will use the tools that are available to them? Minister of Mental Health and Addictions. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, tens of thousands of people are getting immunized every day, uh, but the final mile of the pandemic is uh, proving more difficult, and the situation is indeed serious. Uh, the health minister has spoken um, at length, and Dr. Henry has answered multiple questions from the media about where and why rapid testing can be used uh, for and where it is used best, for example, in remote communities. Um, Right now, uh, the health minister and uh, uh, Dr. Henry are speaking about new measures uh, in a press conference around COVID-19. Um, we'll keep uh, taking the advice of public health around how to best use the resources available um, and continue to work together to uh, uh, flatten the curve and keep people safe. Leader of the third party and supplemental. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. And one of the, one of the advantages we have with COVID-19 and the rate at which it's transmitting around the world is we can look to jurisdictions that have actually managed to get variants under control, like the UK. One of the tools they've used has been rapid testing. I think we can look outside of our own borders to look for solutions. Throughout this pandemic, Honourable Speaker, we've heard from the Premier and the Minister of Health that public health measures are up to the provincial health officer and those who advise her. Last week, however, the Premier commented that travel restrictions were a decision he and his cabinet were discussing. The Globe and Mail wrote, quote, Premier John Horgan will meet with his cabinet to debate further restrictions as the latest, and as the latest measures imposed March 29th have so far failed to slow the third wave, end of quote. I think British Columbians should have some clarity about exactly how decisions are being made when it comes to responding to this pandemic. My questions for you, Honourable Speaker, is to the Premier. Can the Premier or somebody from Cabinet clarify for this House and for the public who is making decisions about public health measures and what is the process for that decision making? Government House Leader. Thank you, uh, Honourable Speaker. Well, obviously, as the uh, member stated, the uh, Provincial Health Officer, uh, has been making uh, um, uh, orders and recommendations which uh, have been uh, put in place for uh, British Columbians to follow. At the same time, we also take advice in terms of, uh, the member mentions travel restrictions, and as has been indicated, Cabinet uh, is looking at various options and various methods in which uh, those, those could be put in place and how you could be put in place and how they could be enforced. Uh, I would also take the opportunity to remind the member uh, that it was this government that uh, dealt with the federal government and put in place the first international travel restrictions in this country that ensured that people had to quarantine, that ensured that people had to, to have a plan in place when they arrived to Canada, because there are literally hundreds of thousands of Canadians who live outside this country and have the right of return. And I can tell you that, for example, when we started back in April, less than 50% of, uh, of travelers returning to this, uh, to this province had any sort of plan in place. Uh, the latest statistics show that close to 85-86% of Canadians returning to the country now, to British Columbia, have a plan in place on how they're going to quarantine and how they're going to, uh, to, to self-isolate. We will continue to take the steps that are necessary by working with the federal government and working with our provincial health officer to ensure that the proper travel uh, issues are dealt with and they're dealt with comprehensively and in the best interests of the people of this province. Member for West Vancouver, Capilano. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. For many years, there have been victims of crime in care and custody of government who did not receive benefits they were entitled to receive. Government let down vulnerable children by failing to apply for victim supports, such as counselling. To the Minister of Children and Family Development, has the ministry identified how many individuals there are for whom victims' benefits were not pursued? Minister of Children and Family Development. Thank you, Honourable Speaker, and thank you to the member for the question. This is an important matter that um, I will discuss with my team and I will get a response back to her. 
Member for West Vancouver Capital Unknown Supplemental. Thank you. The Premier's mandate letter for the Minister of Children and Family Development calls for her to, quote, ensure support reaches all youth, unquote. We know that supports for victims of crime did not reach many former children in care. Will the Premier direct the Ministry of Children and Family Development to identify the number of formal children in care whose victims' benefits were not pursued? Minister of Children and Family Development. Well, thank you, Honourable Speaker, and thank you again to the member for this question. It is a really important matter in my ministry, making sure that we provide uh, supports for children and youth who have been in government care. And I know uh, the member will know that in my mandate letter, I am asked by the Premier to make sure that we create a cross-government approach to making sure that we're able to provide successful transitions for children and youth who have been in government care and to make sure that they're able to fulfill their potential. And already the government has taken really important steps to make sure that supports and services are there. For example, the tuition waiver, that is a wonderful program that so many young people have told me has been liberating for them to access. And so I am mandated to work with many of my colleagues across government to make sure that we do build that, trans that successful transition. And I'm absolutely committed to making sure that we do that successfully. Thank you. Member for Abbotsford West. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I'm trying to reconcile the minister's last answer, the words, with the actions of her ministry. Uh, we know that there are hundreds, if not thousands, of former children in the care of government who did not receive benefits to which they were entitled as victims of abuse or other criminal misconduct. Many of those children, many of those victims, were Aboriginal children. They are now endeavouring to come together and pursue their rights, pursue those benefits that they were denied. And yet, inexplicably, the Ministry of Children and Families is opposing, opposing their attempt to pursue their rights as a group of victims. Can the Minister of Children and Families explain why her ministry is opposing, actively opposing, these victims who merely want to pursue the benefits they should have received as children in the care of government. Minister of Children and Family Development. Thank you, Honourable Speaker, and thank you to the member for the question. Our government is absolutely committed to making sure that we provide uh, supports for children and young people who have been in government care. And I'm working diligently with uh, other colleagues and ministers in government to make sure that we're able to build that system, uh, not just for children and youth who are in care now, but to make sure uh, that we're able to create that pathway um, for now and into the future for children and young people to fulfil their potential. Thank you. Member for Abbotsford West on supplemental. Well, again, Mr. Speaker, I'm having great difficulty reconciling what the minister has just said with what is taking place this week. With her ministry in court actively opposing the application being brought by this group of victims to have their claim heard as a group of victims. It's the minister's job. She has her role. She is a member of cabinet specifically to defend and advance the interests and protect children in care. And if necessary, protect their interests after they uh, leave government, leave the care of government. Why isn't she doing that? And instead has apparently directed her ministry to actively oppose the applications of these former children in care who are seeking nothing more than the rights and benefits that they were denied when they were in the care of government. Minister of Children and Family Development. 
Thank you, Honourable Speaker, and uh, thank you to the member. You will know any matter before the courts I'm unable to comment on. Member for Campbell Southampton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, well, for three years, we've been uh, asking uh, this government, urging this government uh, to provide uh, real solutions uh, to help small businesses who have faced massive uh, property tax increases based on the development potential of the airspace above their heads. Uh, instead, the finance minister put together an interim tool that one year later, not one of the 162 municipalities in British Columbia believe is workable. And I say that, Mr. Speaker, because not a single one of those municipalities is using the tool a year later. Now, with the NDP uh, f uh, imposing further speculation uh, taxes on the air above small businesses, the same uh, minister is promising yet another interim measure. So my question to the Premier is this, uh, what exactly is this government's uh, latest interim plan and why doesn't he solve the problem permanently today by throwing a lifeline to all those small businesses that are out there uh, that absolutely need the help and are barely hanging on? Attorney General. Uh, thank you very much, Honourable Speaker. I know that the member has heard the Minister of Finance say that she is aware of this issue and will be putting in place a solution for it in relation to the speculation tax. I know the member was also here because I was here too uh, when the member was on the government side of the House and the issue of split assessments generally was raised. Uh, they went many years without addressing this issue. It is a challenging issue, but I can assure the member that the, with the Minister for Municipal Affairs, uh, we will address this issue and, uh, and he can rest assured it will be addressed once and for all. Thank you. Member for Kamloops South on supplemental. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, this government has been in power now for uh, a full term. They're actually into their second term. Uh, we have proposed uh, a, a solution uh, three years in a row uh, to address this, uh, this challenge of rising property taxes in a meaningful way. And it is clear that the minister has completely botched uh, the file. Uh, as I just said, there is a solution. Uh, a broad uh, coalition of stakeholders, including a working group of, uh, of uh, uh, mayors and, a, and an intergovernmental uh, 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 committee that was formed a number of years ago, small businesses, chambers of commerce, nonprofits, uh, they all support the solution that we have uh, brought to life in this chamber and by, in bringing it forward three times, uh, that solution being a new property, a commercial property subclass uh, via split assessment classification. Now, last week, the Premier said, and I quote, I don't believe it's fair to tax people for space that doesn't exist, end quote. So again, uh, if the Premier is serious about giving small businesses a fighting chance to survive, will he tell his minister to scrap her failed interim tinkering and ax the tax now? Attorney General. Well, thank you very much, uh, Honourable Chair. I, uh, there are a lot of members in this House that could fairly stand up and talk about uh, trying not to botch a file, but with all due respect to the member, I don't think he's one of them. And I say that from experience. We will address the issue. The Minister of Finance will address the speculation tax issue. And the Minister for Municipal, Municipal Affairs will address once and for all the split assessment issue as we committed to when we put the interim fix in place. Member for Fraser Nicola. Thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker. School districts throughout British Columbia are facing huge deficits and the possibility of major cuts. The province's incompetence in delivering a budget on time has only added to the stress for teachers, students, and parents. Surrey could face a $43 million shortfall. In Richmond and Victoria, more than $7 million, and more than $4 million in Vancouver. To the Premier, why are you making school districts choose between cutting staff, cutting supports, or cutting programs? Minister of Education. Well, thank you very much, Honourable Speaker, and thank you to the member for the question. I know that we all across this House value uh, education, although I will say that over the course of our government's uh, uh, tenure, 
uh, we have made significant, uh, significant investments in education, both on the operating and the capital side. Now we're a bit, we have some sequencing going on here because uh, school districts, of course, are uh, are required by March 15th. Uh, we, we tell them what their operating grants will be and they, uh, they, uh, they, they, they commence uh, start their planning for September as, as they're required to do. But we're gonna see a budget tomorrow delivered by our finance minister. And I am very much looking forward to uh, the commitments that this government has historically made with record, uh, record um, increases uh, in and investments in education. And uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see what that looks like tomorrow, but there's no question over the last three years, we have seen uh, significant increases in education, both in operating and capital. And I'm very much looking forward to tomorrow. Member of Fraser Nickel on supplemental. Thank you. The pandemic has been tough on parents, teachers and students. Trustees with little support from the province have worked to negotiate through these unparalleled situations. In particular, the needs for mental health supports and meal programs have seen an uptick as families struggle. To the Premier, will he commit today to increasing support for mental health and meal programs so that students and families who are relying on them don't have to worry about them being cut? Minister of Education. Uh, again, thank you, Honourable Speaker, uh, for the quest, uh, for the question to the to the member. Uh, I, I ra she raises very important supports that students receive in our education system. It's not only the learning; it's the access to mental health supports and to meal programs, and those the importance of retaining uh, kids, making sure that kids have access to those programs in school, has been a fundamental part of our government's approach to how we have dealt with, with, uh, with, the, with the pandemic. And there have been remarkable stories, I want to say, uh, of, of teachers and principals, school staff, trustees stepping up to ensure that kids have access and that families continue to be connected to things like um, meal programs. Uh, we have made, our government has made record investments to correct many years of underfunding of our education system. And we are gonna to continue to do that. We are gonna to continue to make sure that kids have access to the quality education that they need and to the supports that go along with that. Thank you very much, Honourable Speaker. Opposition House Leader. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Well, Mr. Speaker, back in December, uh, when the only bill that we had to debate was delaying the budget for two months, we raised several times that delaying the budget would have an impact on, on groups and agencies and governmental bodies like school districts. And we were told, no, it won't have any impact. We just heard the minister say the school districts had to start getting their budgets in by March 15th, which is usually a month after the budget's already been introduced. This year, it's a month before the budget's introduced. So there's a lot of worry for school districts. The members of Camp South the Kamloops, South Thompson and myself met with our district last week. They have a budget shortfall. They don't have assurances that the extra funding for COVID supports will still be in place in September. So can the minister confirm today that all of those extra supports for PPE, for extra staff, extra custodial work, all of the COVID supports that school districts currently have in place will still be funded in September for them? Minister of Education. Thank you, Honourable Speaker, and, and, and thank you to the member for the question. Our government has uh, worked very closely with our, all of our education partners, uh, rights holder groups throughout the course of the pandemic to ensure that schools had the resources that they needed in order to address uh, the, the ensuring that the safety plans in our schools uh, are, are fully implemented. And uh, again, I will say that our government has made record investments in every single aspect of education. We have built new schools, we have seismically upgraded schools, we are building new playgrounds, we are investing in mental health, we have mental health um, uh, integrated teams uh, rolling out in, in school districts. We are uh, making the investments that kids and families need in order to ensure that they get the education they need. We're gonna to continue to do that and I'm very much looking forward to tomorrow. Opposition House Leader on Supplemental. Thank you uh, very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the reality is, though, districts right now are facing huge deficits. 
We know this to be a fact. 43 million in Surrey. Richmond and Victoria, 7 million each. 4 million in Vancouver. Kamloops is in a deficit despite draining their reserves. It's simply broken right now, and all the people are looking for at the school district tables are assurances from this government that cuts will not have to happen. Unfortunately, we can't get that today, it sounds like. So I'll ask one last question to the minister. What, uh, there's been talk about the consultation being done uh, across the spectrum. How much uh, con consultation has been done with the BCTF about the promise around childcare in schools? Because that is yet another area that the Teachers Federation is very concerned about their lack of consultation from this minister and this government on changes that are being brought forward by this government. Government House Leader. Thank you, uh, Honourable Speaker. And uh, I must say, I do find it interesting the questions that have been asked in the House today. Uh, a lot of them budgetary, uh, budgetary questions. And I can anticipate uh, the, the excitement uh, of the opposition, Honourable Speaker, after realizing that a government that we have had in power now since 2017 that has made record investments, not only in education, and in health care, and in transportation, and in transportation infrastructure, right across this province, has fought a pandemic, ensuring that all British Columbians that we get through this and come out of this pandemic stronger want to know what's in that budget tomorrow, Honourable Speaker. Well, I can tell them, Honourable Speaker, tomorrow afternoon the Finance Minister Members. will stand in this House and deliver a budget that they will, in fact, be proud to support, Honourable So I am looking forward, Honourable Speaker, to that budget being delivered tomorrow, but most important, given all the requests for the spending that they have made and all the programs that they want to see in place, that they vote for that budget when we have that vote in this chamber. The bell ends the question period.